so that we can uh, enjoy the rest of this nice evening. Uh, I have a somewhat short message, which I know everyone you love to hear that from me. Uh, <laughs> and uh, um, but I think it's uh, it's going to go along with kind of like the style that I normally do, where it doesn't matter if you are a brand new one day old Christian or a 40 year old veteran. I think this is a, a truth. It's kind of a reminder for everybody, something that uh, I think that we can all learn from. And even in studying this, being uh, preparing for this evening, it, it's made me look at things in my life as well. So it always helps me when I can learn from what I'm telling you you all as well. So uh, my text is going to be in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. This is a verse that is uh, uh, a very popular verse. It, uh, there's a lot of messages that's been, that have been uh, preached on this, different angles, different aspects of it. And uh, it's, uh, it goes very well as the, the text verse to the points that I'm going to make tonight. Okay, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. Now, we all know a roaring lion. We think of the king of the jungle. We think of the, this great big massive beast, this great big animal. He's strong. He's, he's, he's strong. He's got a, a very keen eye. He's uh, very intelligent in the ways of his hunting, in the way that he stalks, and, and, and the way that he, he carries himself demands respect. It commands respect and in everything that he does, even when he's just laying there, he's this massive beast laying there as a king, the king of the beasts. But the thing is, is when he's hunting, he's not roaring. And that's, a, and that's a, something that we need to remember. Just like the devil, as it says in this verse, our adversary... He's going around like a roaring lion, okay? And the devil shows that every day in the world that we're in. Every single day, whether we're sitting quietly at home in our house or we are out and about, we're at work, at the grocery store, we can see it everywhere we are, the devil is roaring everywhere. But the thing is, the catch to that is, though, is when the devil's hunting, he doesn't make it as obvious because he's got to snare you. He's got to catch you. Let's go ahead and pray and I'll get going. Dear Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for this beautiful day that you've given us. I want to thank you for everything that you do, every, all the blessings that you give us, whether they're big or small. I uh, want to thank you for loving us. I want to thank you for allowing us to be able to be here, to hear the message. Lord, I want to thank you for, for showing me this message and, and giving me the, the ability to, to work it into something that, that, I can, that I can present to the people in the church and help me to be a blessing, help me with my words, help me to not stumble and, and lose my words, help me to flow through this very easily. And in your name, amen. So it says to be sober, which it's not talking about not, I mean, I guess in some cases it could be talking about not drinking. I mean, in, in RU, that was, you know, this is what it means mostly, but, but it, it means to, to have a clear mind, to be clear minded. Uh, when, you're, when you're not sober, there's things, you have things on your mind. Your mind is clouded. Much like alcohol, 
your mind is clouded and you make bad decisions, uh, in life, you have, you have to keep a clear mind to, so that when the devil comes after you, you, you know what to do. And it says to be sober and vigilant, to be watchful, to have a clear head and to be watchful because our adversary, our enemy, the devil, as it says, is like a roaring lion. And he walks around everywhere. Uh, it's, it specifically states it in, in Job where the devil was going back and forth looking for somebody. Okay, and so who's to say that that's not happening today? He's wandering to and fro all over the earth looking for somebody like Miss Jennifer. He's looking for somebody like Miss Jackson, like Mr. Pip. He's looking and searching for that prey because that's what a lion does. Not necessarily the, 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 the king of the pride, the lion, but the lionesses, that, wh what do they do? They look and they search and they roam around and they look and they look for the, we the weakest one. They're not going to go for the strong one. They're going to go for the weak one, the one that's maybe a little lame, a little weaker. It hasn't had as much food because it wasn't strong enough. It's going to go after the weak one, and that's what they do. And they're quiet, and they stalk that, that, that prey. We'll just use uh, an antelope as example. They'll stalk the antelope, they'll, they'll get down in the weeds, and they'll, they'll crawl on the ground, and they're looking and looking. And if that antelope gets a little bit of whiff of that lion and they go on high alert, that lioness will just lay there, quiet, not making a move, barely breathing, until that antelope feels comfortable again. And she'll take a little a couple more steps and creep in until she can get her chance to go after that antelope. And that's what the devil does. That's what the devil does. He, he gets us comfortable and tries to get us into his snare. And he'll sneak in, and that's how he does it. Now, 1 Peter, obviously, was written by Peter. Okay? Now, who better an example to write those words right there because he was he's a perfect example of the devil going after him jesus even warned him warned him multiple times that the devil's coming after him. not in so many probably not so many words i'm just paraphrasing here but he warned the devil is coming after you the devil is coming for you he's after you he's going to get you and peter didn't listen to him he didn't listen he didn't heed the words of Jesus, and look what happened to Peter. Denied Christ, put a mark on his name. I have four points tonight on how to avoid Satan's snares. The number one point, my num number one, is don't stray. In Psalm... 119, it says, before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now have I kept thy word. Okay, that was written by David, one of the greatest kings that ever lived. He said, before he was afflicted, he went astray. Say, I mean, giving the impression that when he was right on, right on target, in line, he didn't have these problems of thinking about going astray or being afflicted. He didn't have to worry about it. He didn't start being afflicted until after he had already gone off the beaten path of his, of his beliefs, he, of his faith, of straying away from what God wanted him to do. When he started to do that, that was when he started running into trouble, a whole lot of trouble. And with that, once even though he came back, he, he was still punished. He wasn't allowed to build God's temple. He wasn't allowed. That was his punishment because he had strayed, because he was tempted and he went off. He went astray. I don't know the numbers. All I hear is, all I know is the stories, okay, because I didn't have time to look any of this up. But every year, there are hundreds, maybe even thousands of people, they get lost in the mountains or lost in the woods because. Why? Because why? 
because they go off the path. They stray away from the beaten path where it is safe. Sarah and I went to Turkey Run State Park for our first wedding anniversary, and in our youthful energy decided that we were going to walk all the extreme paths. <laughs> That's, that won't ever happen again, believe me. But, but w w the reason I mention that is because these paths, they had warning signs at the trailheads. Do not go off the path. Do not go off the beaten path. Stay on the path. And the reason being for that was because a lot of these extreme trails, if you even went a foot off of that beaten path, it was a hundred foot drop down a hill. I don't even know if you could even call it a hill. I mean, it was more like a, it was more like a controlled cliff is basically what it was. And the only thing controlling you from falling down full speed with gravity was the trees and the bushes and the brambles and the thistles that were growing up out of it. So with that, staying on the path was a good idea. And in this example of not straying, if we stay where God wants us to be and not get off of the path, I mean, we're not going to have a problem. We stay on the path. We don't stray. Some... Uh, some Christians, a lot of Christians, what they do is the, the one thing that they do under don't stray is they neglect their prayer life. They neglect their prayer life. They fail to study God's word the way that they're supposed to. And they become a victim of, of Satan's snares. They get away from what they're supposed to do. Now, when you do your devotions and you read your Bible, generally, most everybody I know does that first thing in the morning to start the day. Get up in the morning, make coffee, read your Bible. It's the order of things. I mean, that's, I mean, that's the way I do it. So, and when, when we get away from that, when we stray from that schedule that we have, when we don't read, I don't know, has anybody ever noticed that if there's a day you were up late the night late up late the night before or something was going on you didn't get home late you didn't get to bed on time or you had a bad night your back hurt you couldn't get comfortable you couldn't sleep and you woke up late and lo and behold oh my oh, i got to be to work in 20 minutes I, I, i'm sorry god and you run out the door and go to work. Has anybody ever noticed that when that happens, norm, your day just doesn't really go right? Like every little thing is an issue. Every little thing is a problem. There's always something that's just, it, it's eating at you all day long. You just don't have that peace. And then the next day you get back into your habit. All right, I'm up at 5 a.m., did this, this, this. And it goes a little bit better. It, it, just, it just kind of seems like that to me. Anyways, well, the, the problem with that is, is I, I, I think God understands that. I, I, I really do think that. I think he does. But where the problem runs in is the snooze button on the alarm clock. You know, you, I don't feel like getting up this morning. I'm just tired. I need 15 more minutes. That I, and you do that, and you do that. No, nope, I got to get up now. I don't have time to read my Bible. I don't have time to pray. Don't have time to do that. And you do that one time. That one time of doing that intentionally, you're taking a step off that path. Just a little bit. Just a little. And the next day, you're back to it, and you're back to it. Maybe three, four, five days. Maybe even a month later, when you don't really feel like getting up and you need that extra 15 minutes, rolling over and hitting that snooze button is just that much easier. And then three weeks later, it's that much easier. And then a little bit later, it's that much. And before you know it, you have strayed away from absorbing God's, his instruction manual 
on how your day is supposed to go in your life, and you don't talk to him, you get away from your prayer life, and eventually, instead of being on that beaten path where at the trailhead it says, stay on this path, you're, over, you're way over there at the bottom of the ravine. The other thing that, that we have to look out for under the don't stray is our non-Christian friends, people that aren't saved, people that don't love God the way we do. That's one of the that's one of the ten principles in RU. People that don't love God are not they're not going to love God with you. They're not going to do it because they don't hold the same morals. They don't hold the same values that you do for your God and your beliefs and your Christianity. They're not going to do it. And it's very easy. It's very easy for to, to fall into that trap if you've strayed away. If you're on the path where you know you're supposed to be and you know where God wants you to be, then you don't really have to worry about that so much. Last week, I gave an example of the managers. They were all going to go out on Wednesday night. They were going to go out. They were going to go to the bar, have a good time. They invited me. No, it's not going to happen because I don't do that anymore. I don't live that life. That is not me that is not, it's not in my belief system. It's not in my moral, my moral, my moral level is higher than that now, and I'm not doing it. One of the reasons being is because the next day they came in, they looked like death warmed over. Because <laughs> apparently they had a real good time. And you know what? The, the thing is, I'm going to share this with you. I do not miss that one bit. I felt sorry for him. Because you know what? If that's, because I remember doing that. That's what I thought I had to do to have a good time. Even though I suffered greatly the next day, I was having a good time. I had friends. We were doing our thing, you know, blah, blah, blah. That next day, though, and you know what? I don't miss it. I feel sorry for him. They said, oh, yeah, we had a great time. It's like, yeah, it looks like it. <laughs> it looks like you had a great time. I had a great time last night too, and I'm up and at it. I'm working, you know. So, but but our our friends, our non-Christian friends, um, or even our Christian friends that have fallen. I mean, it's not it's not that it's not just limited to to unsaved the unsaved. That goes as far, that goes along with. Christians that have fallen along the wayside that are in the ravine that have let their morals and their principles and their standards and any other word you want to call it that, that have let them go, it goes for them too. And those are the people, even though we need to care for them and love them and pray for them and be by their side if they need help, those are the people that we, can't, we need to stay away from. I will love you, I will be your friend, but I can't be around you. And that goes for the you know Christians as well, the unsaved as well as the Christians. Uh, the the other part is well that goes along with yielding to your old life. Newer Christians have a very hard time with that yielding to the old life. In RU, that is that is one of the things. That's that's the reason they have RU on Friday nights. They have RU on Friday night from this is like what is it six thirty or seven o'clock until nine o'clock because that's the busy time of going to the bar. That's the prime time of getting dressed, going to the bar, getting, getting your drink on and everything. That's why they have it during that time. And new Christians, it's a very hard, they have a very hard time with that. Even old Christians, veteran Christians have a hard time with that at times. And they, they become victims of, of Satan's snares. All because... They strayed, all because we strayed off of the path. We have, that is the one reason why, in order for us to not stray, we have to guard. We have to guard our devotional life diligently, drawing near to God on a daily basis to get our, to get our, 
our, our, our daily medicine, our daily, I don't want to say daily fix, because but, but that's what I'm going to say, because that's what it's like. Because eventually, if you get into this book enough, and you get into your prayer life enough, it's going to be an addiction for you in a good way. When you get saved, and you get close to God, and you draw closer to God, and that old life has gone away, this right here is what's going to fill that hole. Because when you get rid of one bad thing, say you get rid of one bad friend, you get rid of one bad habit, you get rid of one bad, uh, whatever it is bad that you're doing, there's going to be a hole there. So what do you need to do? You need to fill that. You need to fill it with something good. You need to take evil and replace it with good. Because if you don't replace it, if you don't hold your devotions and your time with God dear to your heart as an addiction, the bad is going to fill that hole right back up and you're going to be right back in the ravine where you started off at. Guaranteed. Never fails. It'll happen. The church I grew up in, in Bridgeport, they, uh, th there, was, there was a man there. He was an evangelist. An evangelist. Went around preaching, had like prison ministries, jail ministries, preaching at different churches, is a good man, very good man. Had, I mean, had, had a wife, kids, I mean, a beautiful family. They, they went to the academy, they went to the church, everything. He was a good man. An evangelist preached the word of God from the pul pulpits like this. And he strayed. And I can about guarantee you 110% he started to stray because he let his devotion slip. He let his walk with God, first thing, slip. He stopped reading his Bible. He stopped having a conversation with God. Now, I'm not going to say what he did, but right now, He's still sitting in a penitentiary in northern Michigan. All because he strayed. He strayed. And I can tell you story after story after story of people that I've known, people that I've read about. They were good people, good Christian, good Christian people. Let me rephrase that. Good Christian people, and they strayed. And the reason being is because they got away from their walk with God. They got away from their devotion. They let their devotions go first because that extra 15 minutes of sleep was more important than getting up and working on their relationship with God. And, 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 and that's, not just, that's not just limited to the other guy. Okay, because, I mean, it can happen to anyone. It can happen to anyone, anyone. It could happen to. Um, there was a sermon that I was listening to by Pastor Jackson. Uh, it was about Jacob, who I just preached on last week. Jacob, coming at it from a different angle, but he talked about, I mean, you know, I mean, his dad, you know, and that was one of the points that he had brought up was the fact that he, had, that, that, that he let his, his limp get to him. Well, with that, with letting that limp get to him, he had strayed at some point. He had to have. In James... Chapter 4, verse 7a, says, Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. If we make God our number one priority right off the bat, and throughout our day, because we make him our priority right off the bat, first thing in the morning, we're automatically going to think about that all day. 
because the Bible also tells us that we're supposed to we're supposed to uh, dwell on His law, to think about His law. It's uh, Psalm Psalm chapter one that we're supposed to think on His law all the time, and by doing that first thing in the morning, that's what we do. We, we give ourselves the the material to think on those things all day, which will help us not stray. And it'll also help us to draw an eye to God, to get closer to him, to get closer to him. Sarah and I are close. I mean, very close. I mean, we talk about everything, there, I mean, we, we sit and have conversations about everything, and yet we have conversations about nothing. But the reason that we are at this point, at that po the point that we're at right now, is because way back in the beginning, because we were talking. We were talking. Found out that, you know, there was things she liked, she finally finally found out there was things that I liked, you know, and eventually it got to a point where it's like, you know what, it wasn't just me calling her, it was her calling me as well, sending that text message, sending that message on Facebook, whatever, you know, but we did that through communication, through talking. We drew nigh to each other through, through the, the friendship relationship, at first, and well, and now we're married, you know, and now, I mean, we have a very, a very good relationship because of that, because we've drawn nigh to each other, and we need to do the same thing with God. We need to draw nigh to him, talk to him every single day, every single day, all throughout the day. It doesn't even matter about what it is. I mean, I do it when I'm at work. I can go to an apartment doing a work order, and I'm sitting there having a conversation with God while I'm changing the garbage disposal. I mean, why not? I mean, I'm there by myself. Even when there are so, is somebody there, they're not paying attention to me. All they want is their garbage disposal fixed. You know, there, there's a lot of times I work by myself. I am by myself a lot, and I like it, okay? Because nobody bothers me. I can do my thing. And, I mean, I, I, I talk to God about dumb stuff. I mean, just, I mean, silly stuff. You know, oh, Brother Dan, you talk to God about foolish stuff. Yeah, I, why not? He should be my best friend. I mean, the order that it goes in is it's supposed to be Jesus, my wife, my family. So why not? I have that kind of a conversation with my wife. Why can't I have it with God? To draw nigh to him. And with that, that starts off in your devotion times that we need to protect viciously. So number one, don't stray. The second point is don't strut or be prideful. Don't strut. In Proverbs 16, 18, it said, Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. A lot of Christians lack humility. What they do is they desire the praise and the honor of people instead of God. They go out and they do things under the guise of Christian, not for God, not to give God praise, not for the honor of God, but so that they can look good when they come into church on Sunday. So that they can walk in and be like, look what I did. I did this and I did this and I did this. Well, guess what? First of all, you're not going to get a blessing for that. Second of all, that, that's not the way God wants it. God wants us to do things for him to his, his glory, to his honor. Because to a lot of people, we're the only church that they ever see. And if we're walking around doing things, if we're going to a, if we're going to a soup kitchen downtown, so, downtown solely for the fact to look good in front of your brethren in the church, it's no good. Throw it in the trash, crumple it up, throw it in the trash, and take it out to the dumpster because it's no good. A proud spirit will make you fall. Because if, we, if you all remember right, 
God threw Satan out of heaven for, for being prideful, for being proud. I want to be like you. I can be, I can be like you. He threw him out. So if he can throw out one of his highest angels, one of his archangels, if he will, God will throw one of his angels out of heaven for being prideful, what makes us think that he's going to do any less to us? I mean, not that we can get kicked out of heaven, okay, which, yay us, okay, but he's not going to look at, look at us with a happy, with, with, a, with joy. He's not going to do it because pride is, it's, You're, you're honoring yourself. I mean, pride makes you feel good about yourself. Now, I'm, now, don't get me wrong. You can be proud of something you've done. You can be. I mean, I mean, like there's some things that I do, some projects that I work on, you know. I look at it when I'm done. I'm like, you know what? I'm kind of proud of myself about that. I, just, I did a good job on that. You know, that, that's, that's fine, I think. You know, but on the flip side of that, on the, the other side of that, going around the bush on that, is if it wasn't for God, I wouldn't have the ability to do that as well. Just something to think about. It says in John, for they love the praise of men more than the praise of God. Jesus himself was humble. He's the perfect example of humility. He even said himself that, that he couldn't do anything by himself, but he depended on his father. He depended on his father for everything. And with that humility, knowing that there was nothing that could be done without the help of God, his father, our father in heaven, when we get to the point where we can completely and totally give the credit to God that shows that we're being humble. When we humble ourselves to God that makes him happy. That's what we're supposed to do. And when we humble ourselves to God that's also helping us draw nigh to him. To be closer. To have a closer relationship with him. When we can when we can go and take ourselves and die in ourselves and completely give ourselves to God humbly, then that, that's, what, that's what he wants. That's, that's being more Christ-like. Now, nobody can be just exactly like Christ, but we can be Christ-like. We can humble ourselves in that way to where... It, it says in James 4.10, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he shall, he shall lift you up. When we do that, when we humble ourselves, in a sense, think of, think of back in the old days when the king, I guess they even still do it nowadays, when the king goes by, you either bow your head, you get down on your knee to give praise to the king. Completely wrong. I mean, that's their problem. But think of that as God. When we humble ourselves, we take a knee to God in honor and praise to him. And when we do that, when we humble ourselves and we go out to the soup kitchen or we go out and we're on the highway and there's somebody on the side of the road with a flat tire and we're busy, we got our nice clothes on, but we humble ourselves enough like Christ to stop and help that person, Christ will lift us up. God will lift us up. To lower ourselves, to humble ourselves in front of God is to lift us up because he'll, he'll lift us. He'll lift us up when we do that. Every time, every single time. So number one, don't stray. Number two, don't strut. There is a person that all through growing up in church when we would have 
special offerings, stuff like that, he would always make it a point to let it be known how much he was putting in the offering plate every single time. Well, with that, which I never thought was right I, by any means, but with that, now, years and years later, maybe, maybe not, but I believe that because of, because of that, not humbling himself and being, you know, and just doing it for, for God, God is taking away his gifts that he's had. And this man had some beautiful gifts. I mean, he had a voice. He could sing. He could preach. I mean, just, I mean, so he could sing a song. I mean, it would just like literally drag tears out of your eyes. And slowly God's taking these gifts away from him and not judging. I'm not judging because I don't know for sure, but there's also many, many, many stories about how people have been prideful and not humbled themselves in front of God, and God has taken their gifts away from them because of that, because they haven't obeyed what he wants them to do. So don't stray, don't strut. Number three is don't stoop. Don't stoop, don't bend over, don't bow, don't bow to what's happening. In Romans, it says, be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. It's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to overcome evil with good. Now, as everybody knows, in this day and age, and, and I, I told Sarah earlier when I got home from work that this, this is the point right here that I'm going to have to take a deep breath on because... Um, the morals of this world are an all-time low. An all-time low. They're in the pit. They're in a swamp. They're, they're at an all-time low between violence and alcohol and drug abuse and dishonesty and corruption in the government. This world is at an all-time low, which, I might add, is fulfilling prophecy from Ezekiel, Revelation, Thessalonians, it's, it's fulfilling prophecy because good's going to be evil, good is going to be bad, and bad is going to be good. This is fulfilling prophecy. And with that, every single day that this world goes down the pit of sin and debauchery and every other form of evil that can possibly be in this world. We have to keep our morals and our standards at an all-time high. We have to keep them at a high. We have to have the higher standards. We have to. Because if you go back 40 years, 30 years, yeah, 30, 40, 50, and keep going back and back and back and back, and you'll see from a hundred years ago, with each decade that goes by, every time something more from the church gets taken away from the people, every time another law gets passed, the, the, Christian, the Christian morals that we had in this country are going further and further away. Further and further away. Back in the 50s and 60s and and I think maybe even the 70s, I don't really remember, but they had prayer before they started school at the beginning of each day. And now it's against the law for my daughter to take her Bible to, church, to, uh, to, to school. It's against the law. She can't do it. She will get suspended if she gets caught with a Bible in school. But yet Satan Club can have their meeting at the school in the activity room. Now, where are the morals in this country going to where God can't be there and my daughter will get kicked out of school if she shows that if she's a Christian and believes in God and loves God, but Satan can waltz in 
That right there is the moral and morals and standards of this country was built on going straight down the toilet. Straight to the toilet. And as Christians, we need to keep our standards just as high and not sit back and just let things ride. Because the longer we let things ride, the more the spirituality that is left in this country is going to go away. And then sooner or later, this right here, it will be illegal. It's going to be like Russia behind the Iron Curtain where going to church was illegal and you could get sent to Siberia for however long because you were having a church meeting with, of Christianity. There was a guy named Georgie Vins back when I was younger, probably Graceland's age. He was a missionary, came to our church. He was an immigrant from Russia. He actually, his entire family went to, to prison because they were having church, church services. He, I remember him telling a story about, about how his mother would get him up really, really, really early in the morning like before hours before the sun would come up and they would get dressed bundled up and they would go for a walk and they'd start going walk through the woods and he said it seemed like it would take forever to get there and then when they would finally get there there would be a little group of people in the middle of the woods in the middle of winter having church because they couldn't do it in a warm building because what they were doing was illegal and would get them sent to Siberia for the rest of their lives. In some countries, that still happens. Maybe not with snow, maybe not in Siberia. But there are some countries, you even get caught with a scrap of a page of a Bible, they will shoot you. So, when we relax our morals and we let our spirituality slack, and we stoop over, what happens when in a field? What happens in a cornfield? When the wind is blowing, that corn will start to bow. I mean, it'll wave for a little while, but then it'll start to bow, and it'll start to bend, and it'll start to stoop over and stoop over and stoop over. And then what happens? Eventually, that stalk weakens, and it weakens so much that it just breaks it right over, and it's on the ground. And when we stoop with our standards and our morals for this country and our society, when we stoop down, that is playing right into Satan's snare to get us. When we allow these things to happen, we're, we're literally walking right into Satan's lair. We might as well walk into his living room and say, hey, what's up? And sit down next to him and watch some TV. Because when we stoop over and we let our morals and our standards in our communities go, that's exactly what happens. And Satan's got us. Just like that. Just like that. So avoiding Satan's snares, don't stray, don't strut, don't stoop. The Christians... We, like I said, we, we can't condone evil. We have to overcome evil with good. So you know what? If the people downtown at the courthouse want to have their rally, we should be on the courthouse lawn this Saturday having our rally. Praising God, announcing God, letting people know that he's there, letting people know that they, he loves them. Why not? It's like I said last week, the, the whole country, the whole world spews their vile garbage. Why can't we holler and yell to the top of our lungs of praise and love that a God has for them? Why can't we? Don't stoop. And number four, and this is my final point, don't stop. In Matthew 10, it says, And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that endureth to the end shall be saved. 
People are going to hate us. People are going to hate us, and mostly it's going to be the people that Satan has sent after us to get us. But people are going to hate us. They're not going to like us. You will, you will have friends that will, dis, that will never speak to you again, close friends that will never speak to you again. You will have family members disown you. You'll have family members that if you try to talk to them about anything God or anything Jesus, they'll laugh at your face and they'll, they'll kick you out of their house because they don't want to hear that God stuff. They don't want to hear it. Satan will attract, distract, and attack with his subtle ways. With his subtle ways. He'll go and he'll just put a little feeler out there. He'll, he'll go and flash an advertisement across the bottom of Facebook. Or he'll flash an advertisement across the bottom of your, your Google search. You know, the going and searching for a, an alphanumeric punch set and got some vile ad pop up on the bottom of my screen. Nope. I'm done looking for that today. It's not going to happen. Not going to allow it. Go and, uh, and he'll distract you. He will distract you. He'll distract you from coming to church. He'll go and make something, allow certain things to happen, a chain of events that will, that will make it seem like it is more important than being at church on a Sunday morning. Or better yet, being at church on a Sunday night. Being at church on a Sunday night is, being at church on a Sunday night is just as important as being on church on Sunday morning. Let nobody fool you into thinking that, that is any different. It is just as important because Sunday is our refuel day. Sunday is the day that we have we come in and we refuel our batter, our our engines so that we can make it through the rest of the week. Wednesday nights should be our octane boost to get us through the rest of the week till we can get till Sunday. And if anyone says any different, or anybody tries distracting you saying any different, that I will tell you they are a liar. Plain and simple. The devil will do anything he can to distract you. And once he has attracted you, once he has distracted you, and then that is when he is going to attack you. He will attack, and he will attack. Because like it said in 1 Peter, he's like a lion. He's like a lion wanting to destroy you. When you go hunting, just one more story and I'll be done. I'll read one more verse and then, then I'm done. When you go hunting, if you want to go hunting, you have to find a field, okay? And that's what the devil has done. The devil has found his field. It's earth. Where we live, it's us. We are his biggest, we're his big game trophies. Okay, he wants us. He may not be able to have us in hell, but he can certainly distract us enough to keep us from getting what we can earn in heaven. Guaranteed. And that's on his mind. If he can't have us, he's still going to get us. Okay, well, when you go hunting, what you do is you start in the springtime. You start in the springtime, you find the perfect spot. You figure out the wind direction that it normally goes, a prevailing wind, and you figure out where your blind's going to be. You find the game trails, and the first thing you do, first thing you do in the springtime is you get your blind set up because it can't be any other way. You have to set that blind up in the spring because the deer, are, the deer, are, they're they're paying attention, they're noticing stuff around them and everything. And the other thing is, is you got to give them time to get used to that being there because they may not see it when they're right underneath of it, but they guarantee you they can see it 100 yards away. There's something different about that tree right there, and it spooks them. So through the fall or through the springtime, you put your blind up. And then right around beginning of summertime, now a lot of places you can't bait deer anymore because I don't know whatever, but you start setting out some bait for them. You go and put out some corn 
on dried corn on the cob. You put out some shelled corn, put out up in Michigan, throw out a bag of sugar beets because they love sugar beets because they're sweet. Go and put out carrots, okay? And then by the time throughout the summer, they're getting fat and they're getting, they're getting healthy and they're getting big and they're putting on muscle and they're putting on mass and their horns are starting to grow because they're getting all the nutrients and the vitamins to make, make the horns grow and they're getting that nice big rack on top of their head. And then come fall, what happens is they get used to that path. They get used to going to that path. Their, their bed is over here. They're bedded down over here in the, in, the, in the barley or in the buckwheat or over in the thicket or in the edge of the swamp where nobody can get to. They're bedded down over there. But they know that that food pile is right over here. We well, see by November 15th, and anyone from Michigan knows what November 15th is, by November 15th, that deer's not looking at what that strange thing is up in the tree. He's not worried about that. It's been there for months. He's not even worried about it. So he gets up on November 15th, oh, stretches, yawns. It's time for breakfast. I'm heading to the bait pile. And he goes strutting himself with that great big 12-point rack up on top of his head. And he gets about that far past that spot that he saw nine months ago. And then the next thing he hears is in a sharp pain. Because that bow hunter was up there. He attracted him. He distracted him. And then he attacked him. That's the bow hunter life right there. I mean, 12 point, wow, that would be amazing. Okay, but see, that's, that's the thing. That's what the devil will do. That's how the devil does it. He can go roaring around. I mean, we don't go out into the field hunting for deer, making all a bunch of noise, hollering and yelling, and say, I'm the hunter. Because the deer are not going to come to you if you're hollering, you're the great white hunter. I, I promise you. But it'll take nine months Nine months of hard work, because I'm going to tell you, you're going, you cart a 50-pound bag of sugar beets back into a woods, three-quarters of a mile. <laughs> Believe me, that is some hard work. Dedication is what that is. But you know what? No matter how dedicated that hunter is to get that deer, the devil is more dedicated to get you. And that's what he does. He will silently go around, and he'll lay that trap. He'll put up little distractions here and there. And then when you're used to seeing those distractions, then he'll put the bait out. He'll put the attraction, the bait. And then before you know it, he's got you. The devil may walk around like a roaring lion, to, you know, claiming he's going to get you, to devour you, but he's silently going around behind you for the secret attacks. And that's what he does every single day. And if we don't want to end up in his snare, we need to not stray, not strut, don't stoop, and don't stop. If we get away from our devotions, it's going to make it real easy to stray off that path. If we strut around being prideful, that he will get us. Because it says, right, it says right in Proverbs, before a fall, don't stoop. Don't cave in to the world's ideologies because it'll do nothing but destroy. It's destroying the world that will destroy you. You let it get a hold of you, the snake Satan gets you, it will destroy you. And don't stop. No matter what, do not stop. No matter what. Because if you stop, declaring God's love and that God is there and, and, and telling everybody you can possibly tell who he is, the devil's got you and he will snare you. The last verse I want to read is Romans 8, 37 through 39. It says, Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. 
For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And when we stay on path, on track, doing what he wants us to do, our devotions and declaring his name and not being prideful. All the things that will, Satan will get you, these are the four things that Satan will snare you with to drag you down and destroy you like the roaring lion. And it will happen if we don't follow what we're supposed to do. If we're not sober, clear-minded, and vigilant, aware. We have to be sober and vigilant in order to stay on track so that we don't get caught in the devil's snares. I hope this helped. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for this night. I want to thank you for helping me say what I needed to say. I hope that it was a blessing. I hope that you allowed me to be a blessing for your name. Uh, I wouldn't be able to, I definitely would not ever have been able to be up here on my own. And I, I know that that's you. And I want to thank you for that. I want to thank you for these people being ever so gracious listening to me. Um, helps to have a good night, safe travels home, and helps to have a blessed week and remember to proclaim you in your name. Amen. Thank you.